Hello and welcome to the Friday, August 30th, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Today we got uh, more malware tricks with Python from Xavier. This time it's about patching DLLs. Of course you may say, well, we have to patch DLLs in order to keep them up to date. That's not the patching that Xavier is talking about here. The normal patching would involve overriding these DLLs on disk, but of course an attacker not running as administrator may not have the ability to patch them on disk. And of course, changing files on disk is also easier to detect typically. Instead, what Xavier is talking about is patching these DLLs in memory after they were loaded. And interestingly, Python has access to APIs that facilitate this process. Well, uh, no real big surprise in that sense that these are standard Windows APIs. So Xavier has a couple examples here in the diary that shows how you can, for example, inject malicious code into a DLL. This could be used as Xavier explains, for example, to bypass some security checks. And Trend Micro is writing about a phishing attack that is targeting users of uh, Palo Alto's Global Protect VPN. Global Protect, like many VPN solutions, is offering a web-based landing page that a user can use in order to download the software needed to connect to the VPN. Well, in this particular case, the attacker is impersonating this web page and then tricking the user into downloading and installing malicious software. Once infected, the system will then connect to a command control server, awaiting additional commands from the attacker. And Cisco's Talus research team did write up the latest version of the BlackBite ransomware that added yet another VMware ESXi authentication bypass to its repertoire. This is a relatively new vulnerability. It was originally patched on June 25th and an exploit has been seen in the wild till July 30th. So just about a month ago is when it started to get exploited in the wild. And of course, ransomware always likes these VMware ESXi vulnerabilities. Please, please make sure that these systems are not accessible from the outside. And if there's something else that you probably shouldn't expose to the world, then it's your machine learning development infrastructure. There is a blog post by Naftali Deutsch from Legit Security. They look in particular at vector databases. Uh, these are databases that hold the data typically used for machine learning and AI models. In addition, they looked at large language model automation tools. These are basically these tools that people are creating in order to interface with systems like ChatGPT. Well, both types of systems have been exposed by a good number of organizations. In the vector database case, of course, an attacker may then get access to the training data. In some cases, may even be able to manipulate the training data for the large language model tools. An attacker may get access to, for example, your open AI API keys. So just like you probably shouldn't upload all of your training data to a cloud service provider that will use your data for training without offering or enforcing strong authentication, you probably also shouldn't upload the same data to some kind of internet exposed database that also doesn't offer strong authentication. Well, it's Friday again, and we have yet another sans.edu graduate student here to talk about their research. Brian, could you introduce yourself, please? My name is Brian Almond. Currently work for a very large systems integrator. Been with them for about 10 years, about 15 years in security overall. Quite a few SAN certifications, 15 GX certs at this point. <laughs> so I've uh, been doing this quite a while. Now, your paper was about a topic I think a lot of people are struggling with, how to detect malicious activity among all the noise of legitimate activity you have, in particular when it comes to administrators. Could you introduce a little bit how you approach that problem? Yeah, so I approach the problem by testing multiple uh, 
variants of administrative classes. So I use three different classes to determine what best effective method to do detection. So I use system administrators, just as standard system administrators would uh, do their jobs, right? Using RDP, WMI, PowerShell. And then I had an adversary group. That adversary group was using known hacker tools, things like Sharp RDP, Sharp Move. And then I tested a, an account that had been taken over. So an administrative account being taken over and tried to determine is there a possibility that we can detect the adversary doing any of this malicious uh, activities that have occurred? Yeah, and I think uh, one of the problems I see is that after an incident, people always say, hey, you just have to look for event X. And they don't realize that, yes, that event happens uh, during the incident, but it also happens as part of normal use of the system. Was there a particular event like this or a particular detection criteria that, uh, in your opinion, caused a lot of false positives when you're looking at normal administrator activity? Quite frankly, most of them did, uh, especially RDP. RDP being the loudest of all systems administrators are constantly using RDP. I mean, that's their job. They laterally move for their job. So uh, to trying to detect an adversary moving later laterally via RDP, even in my research, I could not get a correct true positive with any of the default rules. It just didn't happen. Once tuning was in place or once uh, there was some kind of segmentation in place, then yeah, we could filter out uh, good from bad. That's interesting because RDP is such a big issue, particularly when you look at ransomware, and that's often mentioned as sort of one of the top ways how an attacker is initially entering the network and then moving laterally. You mentioned uh, segmentation. Does that basically add additional rules then that makes it more noisy for the attacker? It, it, what it makes happen is that you know what normal is, right? The adversary would have to do abnormal. So for example, if a administrator was using a jump box or a known network always to RDP into a server, you can then look for an adversary coming in from desktop space that would not be a normal path. So you can look via SIM, you can look via ADR for those particular things, and it will stand out. Normally, though, most organizations have not done this kind of segmentation. So if they haven't done this kind of segmentation, what happens is it just blends into the noise. So this is a little bit and come back down to, hey, if you can detect it, you can actually prevent it. And Correct. by moving the detection rules, like you could also say, hey, you know, whenever I see RDP not coming from the jump box, alert me. But you're saying instead, you may as well just block it to the segmentation instead of just relying on alerts. So there's, there's multiple schools of thought here, right? There is, you can do the segmentation and do the blocking, or you can just have your administrators come from a known good location, right? There's no real segmentation involved. So your administrators are coming from a known subnet in your environment. That could be step one, right? Or you're only allowing them to come from a certain subnet coming from the VPN because segmentation seems to be challenging for administrators in general. If you create no normal, then it's much easier to detect abnormal. And that's what I'm really trying to get at here is you don't have to immediately go into segmentation as the main thing, right? Because a lot of people are going to be like, you're going to block me from doing my job. Well, what if we just make it to where when your laptop attaches to the network, it gets a certain IP space, or when you attach the VPN, you get a certain IP space and that's known normal. And then when abnormal happens, you can then easily detect abnormal. How do you actually get better at detecting what's normal? Because that's sort of, a, I think, something that's a lot of people are struggling with. Yeah, getting better at detecting what's normal just means that you have to know the flow of what your administrators are doing. So working with your systems admin team, understanding what methods they use. Do they use methods like, are they using WMI? Are they using RDP? Are they using PowerShell? And what they're not using, you should be heavily detecting on the things they're not using and then pushing them into patterns of known normal for what they are using so that you can detect abnormal. So it's part of it, not a technical problem, but also sort of a layer seven human yeah. communication problem where you need to talk to your administrators to figure out what they actually need and do. 
Very much so. Um, and then you'll also find that, you know, it can be just a, this is how I've always done it, right? For example, PS exec. We run into this all the time where PS exec is still used. There are better tools, but the administrators want to use PS exec because that's what they know how to use. So from a detection perspective, adversaries use PS exec all the time. So that puts the security team in a place where they have to try to now detect PS exec being used in a weird way when they could just train the administrators to use PowerShell instead or a newer method. Okay. Yeah. So really that communication is then important to make it easy to detect because then you have a more uniform administrator population too, if they're using all similar tools and that makes it easier to detect the abnormal attacker because they're not aware of these internal uh, standards. Exactly. Yeah. So if you know your administrators are going to use RDP, you know they're going to use PowerShell, you know they're going to use SSH. Whenever you see something that is different than that, alert, quite simply. If you see something that is abnormal within those protocols, okay, so now I'm RDPing from something that has never RDPed into the server before. Okay, alert, right? But the default detections, at least in my research, the default detections across the board for RDP and PowerShell, they they didn't work at all. So you have to augment. You have to do something to detect the adversary. One thing that's often suggested is uh, to add sort of a time component to your detections, where there are certain time windows where administrators will perform their work and look for abnormalities. Is this something that... Uh, you think works or? I think it works in very mature organizations who have good change control. And, you know, logging into a system is not a standard change. Um, in organiz Basically, what we're referring to here is temporal analysis, right? You're looking for when your admins are known to do work. And then when the admins are not doing work, you would shut those rules off or, or you would heighten the uh, sensitivity of those particular rules when your administrator is not doing work, right? So the issue there is 24-7 shops, healthcare environments. Do you know, do you have good data of when they're going to be doing their changes? Because if you don't, then it's the Wild West. But if you have good change control practices, at, say, for example, you can integrate your SIM with things like ServiceNow or, or your utilities that track the changes then yes, you can easily know when an administrator is not supposed to be making a change and use that. But I find there's a maturity factor there that has to be addressed. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the paper is in the reading room I saw now. So it's available on the sans.edu website in our cybersecurity section. I will add a link uh, to the show notes. Uh, any final words? What are you up to next after you're done with your program now? Yeah, so uh, I'm entering into the instructor program. Uh, okay. So I'll be teaching Security Sec 599 at uh, the upcoming Big Easy here in Louisiana. And then I'll be, uh, you can find me, uh, also I have a YouTube channel, Cyber Attack and Defense. So either of those locations. Okay, I'll probably add a link to the YouTube channel and as well to the show notes. So uh, yeah, thanks for joining me here. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for recommending this podcast to your friends, enemies, and pets. And there will be no podcast on Monday due to the Labor Day holiday. So talk to you again on Tuesday. Bye.